Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kurtzgazat's videos. Specifically, weed. Well, it's less radioactive than tobacco. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I'm not going to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. Cannabis has been vilified to a ridiculous degree for the last century, but it's now finally being decriminalized in more and more places around. I was going to say that is one thing that it actually does have in common with nuclear power is green toxic clouds as how it's been depicted, which isn't the case in either cannabis or nuclear power, though in the case of nuclear power, all potentially harmful effluents are treated. So... It's still cleaner, but <laughs> neither have green clouds of doom. Alt. It's just recently been legalized in Germany, and for very good reasons, compared to legal drugs like alcohol, which will cause one in two. Is that supposed to be the peanut butter jelly time? Deaths just this year, cannabis is pretty mild. So to justify harsh prosecution and punishment, its negative effects have been wildly overstated. Naturally, there was a lot of pushback, and here something went wrong. SpongeBob. If you followed the discourse over the last few years, you might have got the impression that weed has almost only upsides and few, if any, negative side effects. Oh, Lord. Bunch of misinformation about the pendulum shifting the other way. I wonder if in a few years I'm going to have to debunk a nuclear video that's actually exaggerated the effect, how good nuclear power is. I haven't run into it that often, but the one that comes up the most often with nuclear is it can solve all energy problems. And no, not by itself, because it still requires things to be electrified, unless someone can figure out a nuclear-powered car or something. We ourselves contributed to that narrative. Ooh. What made this worse is that criminalization made it very hard for scientists to study cannabis, especially its long-term effects. They faced bureaucratic and legal hurdles, size. and studies often had to rely on small sample sizes. In the last few years, this finally started to change, so it's time to bring new evidence to the discussion. And, well, it's not pretty. While weed is still much less harmful than alcohol, it does have a dark side. It yeah, as far as radioactivity, it's it's not very much. I mean, the same that exists in other plant matter isotopes such as potassium-40, which is abundant in bananas. Compared to smoking tobacco, which has nasty stuff like polonium-210 in there, this is less severe as far as radioactive dose is concerned. It's more addictive than we thought and can have significant negative effects if you use it long term. That being said, you cannot use this while working in a nuclear power plant, or e even while you're off duty. Of course, you can't drink alcohol either when you're working at a nuclear power plant or any other similar critical infrastructure job, so make of that what you will. It seems that, uh, what are you doing? Before you tell us how dumb we are, please watch the video. To be crystal clear, we think prohibition doesn't work and cannabis should be legal. But this also means that we need to treat it as what it is, a drug, with unique upsides yeah. and downsides. So let's take an honest look at some of the latest research. To okay, so they're ignoring medical use. Okay, I was about to, about to bring that up, but okay, they're talking recreational strictly. And yeah, I mean, who am I to say if you should or should not use it, but... All I will say is anything that can cause cognitive and motor impairment, not putting it in the context of a nuclear power plant or anything else that involves critical infrastructure. That's, that's where I'm going to go ahead and draw the line. Weed is getting... And not just weed. Any, anything else that does that. Um, so if it's, even if it's a prescription, if it is medical use, then... There have been instances that I've seen at work about people having to go on restricted duty based on their medications or injuries, illnesses, just like anything else. Stronger and stronger. Cannabis's magic juice is tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. It docks on your cannabinoid receptors, which affects various brain functions. THC activates some regions and calms down others, creating a fun cocktail of sensations. 
The more THC, the more intense the high. The record, I can't speak from experience. I'm fairly clean cut, never smoked anything, never drank anything. Not that I'm saying you should or shouldn't, I'm not a prude, just saying it's not my thing. People seem to be into higher highs, or at least this is what the market is providing. In the US, mm. Canada, and in Europe, the concentration of THC in legal and illegal cannabis products has more than doubled in the last few decades. While ever more potent strains are bred, products like edibles or concentrates with more than six... They got several sources they've cited for that. That's, that's interesting. And look at all those sub-products, including cookies. ...scent THC have become increasingly common, while the share of products with less than 15% THC has declined. Unfortunately, just about every problem weed creates gets worse at higher THC doses. Mm. At the same time, more and more people use weed. In the US, more people consumed cannabis daily than alcohol for the first time in 2022. In Canada, 20... Did not realize that. Interesting. Economics. ...percent of people 16 and older use it, up from 22% in 2018. It's not possible to say if legalization is the reason for this, though, since studies are pretty inconsistent and vary massively between different users. It would also depend on even just something as simple as a voluntary response bias. People are going to be more likely to say they use it after it having been legalized, so I could see that bias among others right off the bat. In some, consumption went up, in others it stayed stable, and the trend to use more weed began in the early 90s and sped up in the 2000s, way earlier than legalization. So today, sure. more people consume more weed than ever before in the last century, and it's the strongest it's ever been. What are we seeing as a result of this? Let's start with something that used to get you laughed out of the room, addiction. Weed addiction and withdrawal symptoms. A big narrative about weed is that it's not addictive, or at least not that big of a deal. And for most people, this is true. Studies clearly show that the majority handle it well. For 8 out of 10 using weed, it's just a casual high and not problematic at all. About Interesting how a lot of things are kind of person-dependent, person and you hear the expression about people have an addictive personality. That's not what they're describing, but some people are just more susceptible to addictions than others, whether, whether it be weed or alcohol or harder drugs or even certain types of foods. 10 users develop a cannabis use disorder, or CUD. CUD has 11 different symptoms, from the inability to stop when you've had enough, to using it when you know it will have negative consequences, mm. to tolerance and withdrawal. They can all basically be reduced to, you're doing it too often, even if it's bad for you, and it's less fun than it could be. There are three major risk factors here. The amount of THC, how often you consume, and your age when you stop using cannabis. The more T. It's interesting because kind of thinking of the body like a control system that likes to maintain homeostasis. Nuclear power plants operate the same way. They're designed to run at a smooth 100% power. But if you're introducing something that kind of slows things down or slows the way systems respond, yeah, that, that could have some consequences depending on what you're doing. Which is, again, why you wouldn't want to operate a nuclear power plant while under the influence. See, the more often and the younger you are when you start, the higher your risk. If you smoke too much weed too often, it will have negative impacts on your life. So if this is you, toning it down a bit will make a big difference. One in 10 users develops a serious addiction. They usually consume daily and their life is significantly impaired or held back because they spend a lot of their time either using or recovering from cannabis use. Since their brain is building a tolerance, they need increasingly high doses or stronger weed, often both. St it's a supply and demand function for your, like your internal control systems in terms of how it affects. Again, kind of like kind of like a reactivity control system in a nuclear power plant. When the control rods are already inserted, say halfway down, and your reactor is still online, that little bit more doesn't provide as much of an effect on the overall reactor system as it does when you first start inserting the control rods. It's fascinating how many parallels there are out there in the world. It's found a variety of negative effects. Heavy users can experience bad moods, 
feel irritable, restless, paranoid, anxious, and even depressive. In a sad twist of irony, for many addicts, it feels like they need weed to fight these symptoms. Maybe it did actually help at first, while in reality, it makes those symptoms stronger and more persistent. Can perpetuate a cycle, sure. Studies also found that loneliness and frequent cannabis use go hand in hand. If you feel lonely, you're more likely to use weed, and if you use weed, you may experience more loneliness. It's not always easy to say which came first, but they seem to reinforce each other. Similar vicious cycles can exist in control systems for your nuclear reactor, too. I mean, look at what happened at Chernobyl. They essentially got their control systems so far out of whack because they kept consistently making the wrong decisions. I mean, I doubt this would cause a personal Chernobyl, at least compared to other substances, but still, familiar with the concept. So, on the one hand, cannabis makes loneliness feel much less bad. On the other hand, it can also make you feel more socially awkward than you actually are and withdraw from friends. This can lead to a mm. downward spiral that ends in self-isolation. I was going to say, I don't know if awkward is the right word. This seems the way they're portraying it is more dark than that. And chronic loneliness. Another thing many people who consume a lot experience is a mental numbness that makes boredom feel okay because it impacts the reward system of your brain. Not great, uh. but good enough. You can spend your day dopamine saturation. Yeah, that's uh, that's a problem. <laughs> Killing time, binging mildly interesting stuff, being numb rather than having fun. Like what? Like some people are probably watching YouTube or this video specifically. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> Boredom is a signal to your mind to get creative or learn something new, but this is suppressed. This also makes quitting so much harder because your daily routines suddenly seem boring and unexciting, making yeah. it very tempting to go back. If you find yourself using constantly, this can also stunt your development as a person. The numbness dulls bad feelings, making it... Okay, I can see what they mean about it being worse when you're younger, especially when you're still developing these things, not just developing physically, but also developing habits and decisions about the sort of things you want to do with your life. ...not to deal with them. But in life, you can only get over bad feelings if you actually feel them, and you have to process them to grow. Lastly, let's talk about physical... That's a good thing they bring up, that you don't necessarily see a whole lot of, of feelings. I'm going to use the word heavy feelings instead of bad feelings, because ultimate, even things like sadness, shame they're very heavy but if you welcome them embrace them processing them i just feel a lot better afterwards now it's not always easy but that's a good point you don't often see that talked about on the internet symptoms the more you consume the worse they'll be for you especially if you use daily withdrawal can cause headaches and sweating or chills decreased appetite in severe cases even fever nausea and abdominal pain you might have trouble falling asleep, and if you do, you might have disturbing and vivid dreams. Whoa. The withdrawal can put you in a depressive mood where life feels daft and pointless. You can feel restless, angry, anxious, or nervous. You may feel unable to do anything at all. After a few days, these symptoms will begin to subside, and after a few weeks, they'll be gone entirely. The exact time depends on how much and how long you've been consuming cannabis. Back to our nuclear analogy, it's kind of like the accumulation of certain waste products, like how THC is um, metabolized by the liver and very slowly excreted, and it's kind of a function of amount, frequency, age, other factors. Kind of like how nuclear waste is processed on site. It's treated, and but sometimes you just have to wait for certain isotopes to decay away before you can process and release. Now, let's get to the worst part. Weed may damage your brain. Ugh. This section was not fun to research because there's fierce debate among researchers how bad weed is for your brain. Okay, and I'll take this with a grain of salt. Whether it has irreversible long-term consequences or not, there's no consensus yet, and it's hard to say anything definitive. Having said that, THC directly interferes with critical brain chemistry. There is some evidence that it may alter its structure. It does this may go away again if you quit after a few years, or not? We don't know yet. The consequences vary a lot between individuals, but especially for heavy users, 
they have a variety of potentially unfunny downsides. The most common one is that your memory gets significantly worse. Sustained heavy use may reduce your ability to learn, your reasoning, perception, attention span, decision-making, language abilities, and impulse control. Most negative effects seem to go away. Okay, I've never heard of any of these, but they said it's relatively recent research that might not be 100% validated. Or at least weaken over time after you quit. But again, we simply don't know enough and need more research. Okay. Where the evidence is much clearer is that consuming a lot of weed is really bad for teenagers on multiple levels. If you start using heavily early, you have many more years to build up potentially negative side effects. Teens who use a lot are much more likely to become addicted to weed. This may just be correlation and weed children. may not be the underlying cause, but heavy weed users are more likely to perform poorly in school and less likely to finish their education. They are on average less satisfied with their life and what they've achieved. At a young age, um even the concept of achieving things could be new. So if it's before you've even really had any significant life accomplishments, man, that's going to numb you out before you've really experienced much of life. So I can definitely see how that can affect younger people worse just emotionally, let alone developmentally. They simply be because if your memory and motivation are stunted, you have fewer interesting experiences and forget the ones you do have. Yeah. And there is strong evidence that teen users are way more likely to develop mental health issues like psychosis, uh. schizophrenia, depression, or anxiety later in life. Once again, the younger you start, the higher the risk. And it also seems to rise massively with high THC doses making highly potent cannabis products even more dangerous for teens. Okay, let's wrap this up. We've only focused on the negative sides in this video. That was the whole point. As we said before, for most sure. people, weed in moderation is totally fine and definitely way less harmful than alcohol. You do you, we're not your parents. The upside of moderation is also that when you do it, your experience will be more intense and special. But for teens, weed, especially using it regularly... That one on the left is terrifying. A lot of it is a bad idea, with potentially life-changing consequences. We know that criminalization did nothing to make this better. We well, we learned that, at least within the US, that prohibition didn't help alcohol at all, so... ...have a new chance under legalization. It begins with being open and honest about the state of science and acknowledging that weed is one drug among many others. Certainly not the worst one by a long shot, but also problematic for at least one to three out of ten people using it. If you really have to try cannabis, there is a time and place, and that's in your twin. You don't have to do anything that that you don't want to do. I'm just thought I'd make that clear. Don't let people talk into anything you don't want you don't want to do, is all I'm gonna say. If you're younger, the science is clear. Don't do it. At least, not yet. You'll have plenty of time to experiment later. Huh. Kind of a different message. All I'm gonna say is, if you use weed, you're gonna miss out on fun things like uh, splitting atoms in a nuclear power plant. Because anything that involves critical operations like that just can't take the uh, cognitive or motor impairment for reactor operators. And that extends beyond just weed. Really, anything that would, that would impair you in those ways. This was a different one. Thanks again for the request, and thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.